Silent Hill Origins was the first survival horror game I ever played. When I was 18 or so, I purchased the game secondhand at the same store I would inevitably return to to purchase such titles as Silent Hill 2, Silent Hill Shattered Memories, Resident Evil 4, and troughs of other games that impacted me to the point of creating this very channel over a decade later. Seeing as how I was broke as hell and working at Pizza Hut, I can't imagine I paid more than $10 or so for it, and if I paid more than that, it was absolutely the result of store credit, which I would later sell it back for because I was a stupid dumb baby child. Can I pay you in screws? I was aware of what survival horror games were, but to this point, I was primarily just playing whatever games I still had from childhood that didn't have cases and therefore weren't able to be traded in for store credit, which as you may have noticed was kind of a problem for me. I still vividly remember sitting at my console in the loft of my parents' home, turning on my CRT TV, turning the lights off, and then within maybe 10 minutes, turning them the f back on, what was that? Pretty quickly, I found myself getting incredibly lost and confused and played through most of the game sitting in a pile of crumpled computer paper I printed walkthroughs onto. I cheated every puzzle and checked my map every single time I went through any door, sometimes multiple times, just to make triple sure I was going in the right direction. And even when the walkthroughs warned me about an upcoming enemy, they would still Still scare the bejesus out of me every single time. We all have moments in video games that we remember from growing up that meant much more to us than just having fun and platforming. And this game had so many of those for me. Walking down those hallways, listening to the industrial slams and stabs of the awe-inspiring sound design, the dread of transferring between mirrors into even more terrifying other worlds, the self-aware present parts of my consciousness knew I was playing a video game and I was just scared, but in my body, a light with cortisol and sweat, it felt more like immolation than immersion. I was engulfed, drowning in a sea of flame, clawing away the flames licking at my feet, shoving my face beneath the burning door for air as the flames of terror itself pulled me ever deeper into the smoke and fog. I loved this game. As I grew older and became better versed in the genre and its various online communities, I discovered that while it meant a lot to me, Silent Hill Origins is not exactly a highlight to most, often being seen as a stopgap between games or a tired retreading of paths plotted too many times already, often by the series itself. It's also known for eroding the carefully plotted lore or laid down by the games preceding it, something that the fans aren't especially fond of. But I don't believe this to be entirely the case, and when I started this journey back to the streets of Silent Hill after not playing it for roughly 13 years, I was convinced that there's much more to this game than anyone seems to be giving it credit for, and that most importantly, I'm right. <laughs> So here I was, ready to put my bias right out front and prove myself to be the tremendous purveyor of taste that I am. Then I started playing it again, and well, let's just say things might not be that simple. So now, many years and many games later, I have returned to the town of Silent Hill, reuniting with Travis Grady for the first time since our first encounter all those years ago. Armed with a trusty sledgehammer, radio, flashlight, and a few extremely special guests, join us as we chase Alessa through the foggy streets of Silent Hill to try to uncover our own true nature, as well as gain an enhanced perspective on Silent Hill or origins. Travis Grady is a truck driver who pulls into the town of Silent Hill, sees a girl in the road, and swerves so as not to crush her beneath the weight of 18 wheels of pure corn-fed American diesel. He's then lured to a house on fire by a little girl in the road and jumps inside, finding a hunk of burning flesh laid out on top of an occult symbol, which he picks up, drops on her ass, and wakes up at the hospital, where he finds a shady doctor who refuses to budge with any information on the girl before disappearing into an elevator unable to be followed. Unfortunately for Dr. Kaufman, however, Travis Grady ain't no Nancy bitch. You get your map, mark down which doors are locked, check out your new environment, pick up some weapons, and look at this man. Look at him hold that sledgehammer! Travis Grady's badassery is no accident, as the game's producer William Ortel would relay in an interview with IGN in 2007 saying, it was a conscious decision to make him more of a physical presence, different than the previous main characters. His look is different as well, matching his rough around the edges persona. Yeah, well, he definitely has that going for him, for sure. I, I think in, in context of the series, though, that might not be the biggest win because, you know, the typical video game thing is a power fantasy and survival horror in general is sort of the opposite of that. It's a, it's a strip you of your power fantasy. So I, I think having a badass character in a Silent Hill game is probably 
the result of, of modern Silent Hill developers sort of misinterpreting or, or not fully understanding everything that's going on in a Silent Hill game. Nah. Speaking of development, when the game was handed to the UK division of Climax after the LA studio was shut down, it was sent as a dark comedy with Scrubs being the inspiration. I don't know if the information is out there on that or if there's any kind of script laying around for the Scrubs Silent Hill game, but I desperately need to find it. Please send it to me if you know that that exists. I'm desperate. Eventually, Travis comes upon Alessa on the other side of a window, only to realize it's not a window at all, but rather a mirror. He touches the mirror before being sucked into it and waking up in a new other world version of Silent Hill where everything looks like a death metal album cover. I've heard that there are a bounty of lore implications this upends, but I don't know. I like that it adds a very cohesive, clean and easy strategy to employing the duality between worlds the game is essentially known for, which is something that I imagine took quite some doing from a development standpoint, especially with the game being developed by a brand new studio for the first time and with such a short development window. Now, moments ago, you may have caught me saying, I've heard that there are a bounty of lore implications this upends. And the reason I phrased it like that is because I have a startling confession to make. I've never played the original Silent Hill. What? I've played Origins, 2, some of Shattered Memories, Downpour, and I think I played Homecoming as well around the same time I played Origins for the first time, but I, I remember very little of it. This being the case, however, after about two hours of playing Origins, I began finding myself lost in my own meandering thoughts and fears. Meandering. I began wondering if I was getting in over my head by doing a video on a brand new YouTube channel on a game that is a prequel to a game I've never played, never played with an, an incredibly passionate fan base. I mean, sure, I have troves of love for this game, yeah. But is love enough? Is my connection to this game strong enough to deliver when I don't have the proper context to the source material the very town itself is built upon? What if I stumble over lore or make an ass out of myself? And should I even tell the audience I haven't played the original? And worse still, if I'm not ready, do I really want to scrap all this work, yes. thus putting off this video that Give I'm so us. fucking excited about? No I mean, I already reached out. I already reached out to people on Twitter. I talked to Avalanche Reviews oh God, and all Gaming News and Silent oh Hillside. God, and you got all these people God. already Why interested to talk to me. I can't. Why do I Jared's going to think I'm such a douchebag. As the voices in my head crescendo into a cavalcade of raucous He's noise, I asked myself what Travis would do in this situation. Would Travis Grady, THE Travis Grady, run away from a challenge tail between his jeans? Well, as it turns out, that decision was never mine to make. Once you step into Silent Hill, your days behind the wheels cease and you become nothing more than a passenger a witness to the perversion and horror you've spent so long pushing away. Because in Silent Hill, the trauma pushes back. And when it do, you gotta be ready. Because even on dry land, you're drowning in a torrential current of your own doing. And before you know it, everything around you has changed. We are not warned of the coming danger by reflective highway signs, oh no. Not phone calls, nor the warm hand of a friend leading you to safety. We are warned only by the sounds of sirens. And so, here we are, after all these years in Silent Hill. Just me and Harry looking for a girl, short, black hair, just turned seven last month. And as someone who doesn't have any prior experience outside of playing the PS2 games, I can finally share my own personal opinion without any nostalgia or bias. And I have to be totally honest here, y'all. This game fucks. <laughs> Most people I've encountered in my life talk about these old games in a kind of off-handed way, almost waving them off as unplayable in the modern day. The controls are jank, the combat's terrible, you're gonna need a walkthrough, yada yada. And they so often get chalked up to, if you're hardcore, play Silent Hill and Resident Evil on PS1. Otherwise, don't even worry about it. I do think it's important to mention, however, most of the people who say this kind of thing, 
they ain't played this game. But that's just how gatekeeping works. People will give you shit for liking my chemical romance, then list off a bunch of real emo bands that only exist in modern context to be referenced by people who don't listen to them. And yes, I am talking about Mineral. Anyone who has ever told you they listen to Mineral are lying. Not me though, I love Mineral. After playing the game through, I could not possibly disagree more with any assertion that it cannot be played today. It's not perfect by any means, and it's certainly victim to certain shortcomings common to the era, but it doesn't feel old in a bad way. In fact, it barely feels old at all, especially if you play fucking indie games. Silent Hill is still to this day a refreshing, exciting, mandatory experience for anyone interested in these games. And I don't feel a single bit insecure about recommending it to anyone even the slightest bit interested. I'd probably recommend the sequel first, but that's less to do with the game itself and more just a result of my own personal preference and enjoyment for the sequel. Something that I did not expect coming into the original was the monster design, specifically in their aesthetic presentation. The monsters in OG Silent Hill feel sometimes incredibly human and grounded, like the nurses and doctors in Alchemilla, in Alchemilla, Alchemilla, pa, ha, the hospital, the, the fucking nurses in the hospital. They look more or less normal with some exception, but the creatures that don't look human don't just look inhuman. They're flat out otherworldly. You don't go back expecting like the dinosaurs or the giant bugs. Like it felt, it, it feels like a dream. We are in a child's dream in a way that I do not feel that in the second or third or fourth games because the monsters are far more grotesque and horror. Like Heather says, not even a kid could believe this. You know, the, the first one definitely feels far more childish and dreamlike in a horrifying way. For further emphasis on the monster design, let's compare the gray children in OG to the straitjacket enemies in Origins. The straitjackets are just updated versions of the lying figures enemies from the second game, but they're a pretty good example of an overall baseline enemy in this universe, so we'll use them. They're a faceless, gangrenous, blood-soaked humanoid with their clothing seemingly fused to the body itself as it lumbers through town. Hate on the brain and junk in the trunk. The gray children in Silent Hill, on the other hand, are barely even humanoid at all. They instead feel incredibly alien. Instead of the gangrenous rust color that has since become synonymous with the game's aesthetic, the enemies are a cold gray as the name suggests, but the gray children aren't the only enemies that bear this color. In fact, most of the enemies found in the game are similar in skin tone, or at the very least, not primarily bloody or green. Their heads resemble a kind of angry pupa, and their fingers are long with these horrible clawed nails that so easily grab you over and over and over and over. I fucking hate these things! Okay, yeah, I sucked at this game, but you get the point. I'm still a novice when it comes to PS1 survival horror games, so much of the gameplay you see here will be pretty embarrassing, but whatever. Oh, by the way, I'll be playing through every PS2 survival horror game on this channel, so if you're interested, like and subscribe, baby. Level design is, to no surprise, a show-stopping performance on its own. You could remove the enemies entirely and be left with a tremendous little atmospheric puzzle game that, while less stressful, would still be an ultimately great game experience because the enemies are, to me at least, a series of challenges to handle while exploring the real antagonist of the game, which is the map. And I don't mean that in a bad way. The map is an antagonist with much of the same genetic makeup of a great Dark Souls boss. It's a beautiful work of technical mastery, a foe that envelops you in its malevolence with such grace, you don't even care that it's gotten the best of you because you're so impressed by how they managed to do that. Like, God, I, I love Dark Souls. We should talk more about Dark Souls. I love the way they lead you around the level just to surprise you with a save point you found earlier but you couldn't access. It's, this, it's the, exactly the kind of clever shit that makes me obsessed with video games. That little clever developer sleight of hand that shows off every once in a while in a way that just reminds you who's boss. Or who used to be anyway. Now, jumping back real quick to Origins, a criticism that I often hear levied at the game is that the warping mechanic to and from worlds is bad and sucks and other such synonyms for this game is fucking trash. This brings me to my first retraction and change of opinion after playing OG, because in the original, at least to my understanding, the other world is a tangible thing. Hell itself encroaching upon the earth, brought forth in part by your own daughter of all things, which is why I will never have children. Silent Hill picks and chooses when the world is normal and when it's dark. 
And this duality is so perfectly balanced and blended into the fabric of both the story and your experience. This is all happening for a reason. We aren't in control of it and we shouldn't be as the realities of hell are much bigger than little old Harry Mason. In Origins, however, they alter this fundamental truth of the world of Silent Hill, instead allowing you to transfer between what I can only describe as parallel universes at will, which I now realize makes no f***ing sense. I appreciate that Origins works toward building on the classic sense of duality these games are known for, and in a vacuum without much understanding of the lore, I think it functions perfectly fine. Like I said, I loved the game as recently as the beginning of this very video, but just as in Silent Hill, things can change rather quickly the closer you look. Regarding issues of the series lore in general, Jacob from Silent Hill side had some insight I found to be extremely illuminating, and I like his take on it a lot. Although Origins has a very fun story, and it's interesting to see the early days of some characters, especially Dahlia when she looks relatively normal compared to her witch or priestess-like look in Silent Hill 1, I think it's important to not confuse stories and timelines from each other. Instead, I treat each title as their own entity, and the effect it has on other games is just pure coincidence. Thinking like this has helped clarify so much of the series for me, and relieve that idea of but that doesn't make sense with the other games. I don't necessarily disregard the story of Origins and its implications of Silent Hill lore, however I do very carefully treat it as its own entity, unless it's absolutely solidified as a constant event. For example, Cheryl's story between 1 and 3 is obviously continuous. If I were to highlight some annoyances regarding the lore, there's a scene at the end of the game where Alessa is floating and uses some projectiles, which is a bit weird. I also find that noise filter a bit of a bastard, but that's not really lore. The Nightmare and Overworld sequences occur in this game, despite Alyssa's story not yet being fully developed. The Overworld is supposedly caused by her other half returning to Silent Hill, which doesn't happen until Silent Hill 1, so what the f*** is going on here? But that's just Silent Hill. And the more time I've spent making content for this franchise, the more I've realised how broken it is at times. But that's just how it is. People will get defensive because they think that the broken bits discredit what shines most about the series, but they're missing the fact that the broken bits can be shiny too. Origins is one of those shiny broken bits of the series that should be acknowledged. And that's my opinion, so if anyone doesn't like it, they could get a shotgun to the face. Okay, time for another big confession. I could not complete Silent Hill. <laughs> I softlocked myself out of the ending because I never found the rifle. And even though I kept finding rifle ammo, I just kept thinking, oh well, I'm sure it'll turn up. Well, I made it to the final boss without having found it. Turns out I missed it a long, long time ago, had about a dozen rounds of pistol ammo and like four shotgun shells with only one healing item, so I was sadly no match for the Incubus. But hey, Silent Hill is a game with a multitude of endings, and the one I got was the most unique. I got a really sad, unofficial ending in which Harry flaps about, pathetically trying to kill a flying demon god with a hammer before being killed to death with lightning. Take that, aliens. Oh, and regarding which ending I would have gotten, I read the diary, I saw the cool fucking motorcycle, Hello, baby. and I think I cleaned up most of the quests for the good ending. I also killed the f**k out of Sybil Bennett because ACAB, baby, God get up to the movie, You know, I'm not sure why the team at Climax made common household appliances usable as melee weapons, but damn did they ever. You spend a lot of time in Origins looting abandoned buildings for appliances and garbage like it's Fallout 3, but if you were to equip one of those and use them, you'd find out that they're actually kind of OP. It also sends the enemies careening onto their ass, opening them up for an execution, which is always fun. 
I carry these with me as often as possible, mainly because it was funny seeing the protagonists of a Silent Hill game running through the foggy streets of town carrying a filing cabinet or a fucking television, so the punch they pack when they vaulted into the face of a foe always felt like a bonus. These items can get a bit heavy, but it's no big deal. Travis can always just chug an energy drink if he gets too tired, a health item exclusive to Origins by the way. The item description of the energy drink reads, a caffeinated drink with a kick. I sometimes drink these on long drives. Keeps me awake. It's a funny tie-in to Travis's life as a trucker, though I think they could have driven this point home a little further and made the item used to keep him awake on long drives a little pill bottle with a cleverly renamed brand name such as Catterall or Byvance or Bethamphetamine. Luckily, you don't really need to worry about fumbling through that massive inventory of toasters and lamps stuffed into your windbreaker, because as it turns out, you can pretty much just fist your way through the entire game, reliably stun locking the majority of common enemies. Travis Grady is all American muscle, baby. All I need are my two boom hours. Get over here, you freak. Who do you think you are walking around with them butt cheeks out like that, giving me all kinds of damn temptations? What the fuck is happening to this country? Come here, you freak. <laughs> Try that in a small town. We eventually make our way out of the hospital and towards the sanitarium, but can't resist a quick pop over to the local butcher shop, as one does, where we have our first encounter with, well, the butcher. This cutscene is amazing in its brutality. The cinematography really reminds me of horror movies of the era, but like in a really good way. There was something really specific to the mid 2000s R-rated horror films, especially the remakes released by Platinum Dunes, such as Hills Have Eyes and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that all have this modernized sepia 70s grain look. And while I can't be sure it was a direct inspiration on Origins, I certainly think it's possible and it was executed beautifully regardless. Talk about a beautiful execution, my fucking god. Now I will say, coming back to this after Silent Hill 1, I'm really missing the rotate controls. This is a real pain in the ass to return to as far as how my hands work. I don't like the way this game feels anymore. You've just got these weird shots that are out to destroy your immersion by making you constantly have to fight against your controls. Broken sound design that puts a world of difference between a sidewalk sound and an asphalt sound. There's definitely a lot here that just does not work. But one thing I will give this game huge props for is the quest design. You find keys that are labeled to their corresponding doors, so you go there. Once there, you find the next breadcrumb, be it a puzzle, answer to a puzzle, cutscene, characters, or another key. It's a beautifully choreographed experience, and the level design itself is the dungeon master of this experience, and a damn good one at that. Now, the little things like how quest design works is definitely something that I expected to be messed up in Origins when I returned to it, but I don't know, man, I, I felt like they really kept the important aspects of the game's soul in this game, something that I imagine was much harder to do than simply giving us more hospitals and horrifying otherworld aesthetics. Speaking of hospitals, this is around the time of the game where I reached the sanitarium, and oh boy, we're gonna be here a while, aren't we? And this is where the mirror mechanic I mentioned liking earlier begins really overstaying its welcome, becoming a really forced, pinned on mechanic that you end up having to use much, much, much more often than I would have liked to. The gameplay loop at this point basically becomes getting to a new area, checking all the doors, finding out that the area you need to get to is blocked by something, finding the room with the corresponding other world mirror, back, track and do it again. God, I love bowling for soup so much. Shut up, you don't get it, you never will. Get out of my room, dad, stop calling the music, I like whiny. The sanitarium also marks the point in the game where the overuse of grain filters and overall darkness of the game starts to really grind on you. I began wondering if this is something that just affected the PlayStation 2 version of the game, or if it also affected the PSP version of the game, and then I started to realize that I don't actually know anything about the PSP version of the game, which is crazy because it was developed primarily for the PSP. And I know what you're thinking, no, I am not going to go back and play this game again on the PSP. Instead, I'm gonna phone a friend. Avalanche Reviews, what do you think about the PSP version of the game? The PSP version uh, in the options has a brightness slider, which wasn't really necessary because I thought just out of the box, the game looked amazing. Cause that PSP, um, it wasn't 
the best in the world. There was a, a bit of ghosting to it, but it represented black levels pretty well. But when going over to the PS2 version, you would imagine that brightness slider would come with it. It's just so it's so weird that they would do that. And I'm not sure what part of the process caused the, the brightness to shift so hard, because I would imagine the hardware is somewhere near similar where it, you know, it wouldn't require an entire rebuild of the game to do this. They did uh, update textures and stuff. So I, I don't know, something could have been injected somewhere along the process, but it just seems a little weird. Dude, and if it was just one layer of grain, it would still be too much, but I could work with that. Instead, they add more grain on when enemies are nearby, but it's okay, no worries. You can just turn your light off. Enemies apparently can't really see you with the light off, so just turn the light off. Oh, f great, now I can't see anything. This becomes a pressing issue in the theater level later in the game where you fight scary dolls that hang from the ceiling and also have butt cheeks, why? This game has no reason to be this horny. At times I can't tell if I'm playing a Silent Hill game or Crash Bandicoot 4. Ah. Speaking of the theater level, regardless of lighting and grain issues that become especially present during this section, it also stands as one of my favorite areas in the series. I love how this level manages to feel so overwhelming at first, like much of the areas in the games, but ends up being a pretty simple layout overall without too many doors and stories to lose track of. There's a real sense of poetry that carries through this entire section, a poetry that fully dawned on me as I realized the puzzles that precede this theater boss fight have you literally setting the stage for the fight itself. A boss fight which is against an enemy known as a Caliban, something that Alessa was scared by at a play in this very theater, and after defeating him, you're given another piece of the Floros, a device I now understand having played the original. Look at me go! Back onto the streets of Silent Hill, we head toward the game's last new area, the Riverside Motel. I'm so happy to say, after all these games I've played on the channel so far, we finally have a final level that truly lives up to the game's crescendo. We've got monsters coming out of every orifice. Some new, some old, all double cheeked up and ready for action. Look at those bounce physics. Silent Hill Origins walked so that GTA 6 could run. There's a sentence no one's ever said before. This feels like the most true to form Silent Hill level in a game filled with true to form Silent Hill levels. I literally played through the first game two days ago and already I feel nostalgic. We get to do some laundry, follow up on some maintenance requests, read a note from Travis's dad that is a stunning example of what not to send someone in a mental hospital, peep through some filthy, nasty motel peepholes, which somehow don't end in any jump scares, which really blew my mind. What are you doing? Eventually, we make our way through the motel, kill the foul butcher once and for all, walk in on some scandalous activity between Dr. Kaufman and Lisa, what are you guys doing here? And finally face the true fear we've been casting away, Travis's father, who hanged himself in this very motel room. After decades of pushing him away and refusing to face the horrors of his own life, Travis is face to face with his own trauma and kills the fuck out of his dad. Hell yeah! Oh, funny side note, the official name for this boss encounter is Sad Daddy, and I don't know why, but I find that incredibly funny. Okay, we're back again with another pack of divorced dads. But that's only one part of the game's finale. We still have a lesson to deal with after all, so after a brisk jog through the wacky streets of Silent Hill, we finally meet up with the rest of the gang and fight the demon within the Floros, Alessa's dream. This boss is reminiscent of the Incubus boss from the original, and man it feels good to have finally been able to have a fair shot at this guy in Origin since things didn't really pan out all that well for me in the original. I was well stocked, multiple handguns, a fucking AK. This was the most confident I had gone into the end of a Silent Hill game in a long time and I could not have been more excited. But it wasn't just me in there, it was me and Travis. And I felt like at this point, I knew Travis. I really understood on a visceral level what he had gone through, what we went through together. All those monsters, all those bouncing cheeks, all the trauma, the trauma he went through as a child having to bear witness to the horrors of the world he inherited. In spite of this, we watched that child, now a grown man, 
put himself last, jumping into a house on fire to save a desperate child who was burned after being used time and time again to fulfill the vile whims of her Munchausen mama. We confronted the treachery his mother was subject to, retracing her footsteps and seeing into the putrid minds of those who were supposed to be protecting her, but they didn't protect her. She was used and dismantled just like Alessa and just like every one of you watching this right now. Together, we confronted the painful image of Travis's father. We read his letters and understood that the man we were so afraid of was himself lost in the fear and tragedy presented by the world he himself had inherited. But still, we pushed onward, and we punched, and we kicked, and we sledged, and boy did we hammer. And by the end of our journey, we understood that the sirens warning us of our worst fears may one day ring, but we don't have to cower when the sirens call. As we gaze into the mirror, we may very well see the result of a nightmarish other world staring back. But as is the case with Travis Grady, sometimes the mirror isn't actually reflecting anything at all, but rather showing us what we're most afraid of and warning us of what's to come. So now I invite you, will you put your fingers against the glass and seek to understand your torment, or will you wait until the darkness on the other side learns to breathe and makes its way into your own waking reality, germinating tumorous beneath your feet? Or alternatively, will you accept what you see before you and confront it? I killed it with a toaster!